Okay, thank you. Thank you, Lydia. Um, okay, so for this week, um, I'll be presenting chapter 27, um, which is a field guide to base R of the R for Data Science second edition book. Um, so to start, the learning objectives for this chapter are to learn a little bit of base R, to learn subsetting with single brackets, double brackets, and the dollar sign operator, um, to learn the apply family of functions, and to learn for loops. And one of the prerequisites for this chapter is to download the tidyverse package, just so we could compare the differences between um, base R and tidyverse for data manipulation. Okay, so the first section, first section is um, 27.2 or selecting, selecting multiple elements with the bracket operator. Um, so as some of you may know, you can use base R to subset a data frame. Um, and then the notation you could use it, it you use to do that is um, X bracket I for if you want to select like a, a row or a column or X I comma J if you want to select both a specific row and a specific column. Um, so here, for example, you'll see there's um, there's about five different ways to subset a vector using brackets. Um, or there's five there's five main types of things that you could subset a, a vector with. Um, the first thing you can do is a a vector of um, positive integers. Um, so here they use the character vector to assign to x um, the numbers one through five written out spelled out, and then using x and the single bracket uh, surrounding the character vector. Um, here they're saying I want to select position three, the whatever is at position two, and whatever is at position five, so three, two, five. Um, and that's what gets printed out here. Um, same thing here. You want to, they're selecting what's at position one, one, five, 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 two, and is shown here within um, this vector. Um, you could also subset a vector with negative integers. Um, so here they're saying um, you're subset, so you're subsetting the variable, you're subsetting the vector that's stored into X with this character um, operator, negative one, negative three, negative five. So you're printing out two, four. Um, this one was a little bit, so they drop the elements at the specified position. So you're dropping negative one. So you're dropping the one that's in the first position, the one that's in the third position, and the one that's in the fifth position. So you only have two and four left. And then you can also use a logical vector. You can also subset a logical vector. Um, so here we're storing into X, we're storing into X um, 10, three, NA, five, eight, one, NA. And then here you're asking which one of these is NA or is not NA, wait. Yeah, yeah so you're only not. selecting yeah, so you're only selecting selecting the numbers that are not NAs. So that these two NAs were removed. And here you're selecting those values of X. Wait, all even or missing values of X. So here it will output 10 NA, 8 NA.
Um, and then finally, a character vector. So if you have a named vector, you can subset it with a character vector. So here we stored in this variable abc equals 1, def equals 2, and xyz equals 5. And so we're selecting, we're saying, OK, I want to know what position x, y, z, and def are, and it will tell you. Wait, no. I want to know what the values are, sorry. And it will tell you what those values are as they're stored in the vector. Um, and so, and the final type of subsetting is nothing. Um, so you could just do x with a single bracket and it will give you the entire, whatever it is that you, you've stored into the variable x. Um, the next, okay, I will just, teach, I will just instruct from the book. So the next section is subsetting data frames. So there's many different ways that you could subset a data frame. Um, you can have, you know, you can select within the brackets, row and columns. You can select only row, rows and you can only select columns from your data frame. So there is, a, there's a, there's like three different um, possibilities for selecting. Um, and so here we have a few examples. So here we've created a data frame that is a tibble. And within that tibble, we've stored X from one to three, Y, which is a list or a vector of A, E, and F. And Z is, um, I think that's the random, I think this function generates random numbers from the uniform distribution. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, and the parameter is three for that one. So with this data, so from this data frame, which is a tibble, we're selecting row one, column two. So the data point that is in row one, column two, which is A. Wait, yeah. And so here we're saying, we're selecting all rows and columns, X and Y. Um, and this is a data frame. And so here we're saying data frame bracket, there's nothing in the row position. So we're selecting the column, um, C we're selecting the column that contains X comma Y, the, the vector X, Y, I believe, or actually, no, I got that wrong. Yeah, X and Y contain all the variables that are in, no. I'm not really sure about that one. <laughs> so it seems like, um, Yeah, so it seems like it's a data, it's selecting the columns X, Y. So it's creating the, this column name X, Y, and then it's assigning it to the part portion of the data frame that has one, two, three, and A, E, F, I assume. Um, and then for the, for the, the select all rows and columns. That one? Yeah, I think it's like it's not selecting a specific row, but it only oh. wants the columns X and Y, so it's not showing a C kind of thing. Yeah. That makes the most sense to me. Um, yeah. So, and then the last one is, I guess you're selecting rows where X is greater than one and all columns so here is um, selecting the data frame and then within the brackets, you're saying um, 
data frame dollar sign x so the parts of the data frame that also were in our x vector i guess that are greater than one so those are the rows yeah so you're selecting the rows where your variable x is greater than one no you're selecting all the rows in a specific variable in your data frame that are greater than one. And yeah, you also, and the X. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and the yeah. X. Um, yeah. So dollar sign is more for targeting specific variables within a data frame or otherwise like columns within a data frame. Um, and brackets allow you to select whole rows. Well, brackets, depending on what you specify, allow you to select rows, columns, rows and columns. Um, yeah. Um, also, when you try to subset um, between a tibble and a data frame, a data frame is is the base R version of a tibble, and a tibble is is the tidyverse version of a data frame. Um, and they're a little bit different, but essentially here, when you store these numbers one through three in your data frame, um, and then you say from that data frame, I want to select, I guess whatever the variable X is, it will produce the results in the form of a data frame. Um, whereas if you, you know, store that same number of variables in a tibble, and then you call, you say, um, use singular brackets, and you ask for, give me all the columns of the variable x, it will, it will give it to you in the form of a tibble. As you can see here, it tells you to tibble with dimensions three by one. Um, and so one way you can avoid this is by specif by indicating a drop equals false. Um, so it'll print out the way that you would want it to. Okay. So the next section is dplyr equivalence. Um, so there's multiple dplyr verbs that are special cases of singular brackets. So for example, you have the filter function in in tidyverse, which is used a lot for data cleaning. Um, so here we've created our tibble data frame, our data frame, which has a tibble format. And then here you can see that we're using the pipe operator to, to filter all values of X greater than one within that data frame. And that's similar to um, this kind of like string of commands in which you are selecting um, those values of the variable X that are not NA. And you're saying you wanna know those values of your variable X that are greater than one. Um, and this is, these are rows, yeah. And you're looking at values that are in, um, you're doing this data manipulation on your row values. Um, another example is the arrange function, um, which is equivalent to using the order function in base R, and they are frequently used together. So from our data frame, you can use the arrange function to um, order your X and your Y, and it's the same as taking your data frame in base R and using singular brackets to order the variable X that you selected from your data frame and your variable Y that you selected from your data frame um, row wise. Yeah, row wise. Um, and then you can change whether it's like increasing or decreasing by indicating decreasing equals true or false. Um, and then you have the select function and the relocate function, I believe both are in tidyverse also, and they are similar to subsetting um, the columns with a character vector. So 
again, data frame, pipe or pipe pipe operator, and then you use the select function to select specific variables. Um, and it's comparable to um, taking that same data frame using singular brackets with the character vector in order to select each of these um, variables. Um, and base R also has a function that combines the features of filter and select called subset. So to give the tidyverse example, you have your data frame pipe to the filter function where you're selecting all values of this variable greater than one. And then you're taking the result from this and then you're gonna pipe that to the select function in which you're then gonna, you're selecting variables Y and Z. Um, and this is the result, which outputs as a tibble. And it's the same as um, taking your data frame and piping it to um, subsetting and piping it to subsetting it by variables of x greater than one. And I believe subsetting using your character variable by variables y and z. I mean, your character function by variables y and z. Um, yeah. So next, we're looking at selecting a single element with dollar sign and double brackets. Um, so singular bracket selects many elements, while double brackets can um, access a position specifically. And both of these kind of operators are used, can be used in lists as well as data frames. Um, but in the data frame example, a double bracket and a dollar sign, they can be used to extract columns out of a data frame. Um, as I said earlier, double brackets can access by position or by name, while dollar sign is specialized by ac or access by name. Um, so here we've created a a tibble, and if we wanted to select, if we wanted to access a specific um, position, if you say, I want to do tibble double bracket one, it will produce um, one, two, three, four, which corresponds to um, x equals to one through four. So you're selecting the x variable. Um, just, and this is selecting it by position. So I believe here we've created some, we've created the column vector X and column vector Y within the tibble. And so here we're saying we want the first column in the tibble. Yeah, we want the first column in the tibble. So, and it prints out one, two, three, four. Here, when we call it by name, you say, t, um, you, you take your, your tibble, you do a double bracket, and you're saying, I want whatever's in X, in the X column, which is the one through four, and it will print it out. And it's equivalent to um, using the dollar sign um, for that same variable, which also prints out one through four. Um, you can also use it to create new columns, which is the base R equivalent of mutate. So here you're just selecting from within the tibble variable X, variable Y, and then you're storing it into variable Z. And you notice how originally when we created this tibble, we didn't have a variable or a column Z. So you can actually use this to create a, you know, as, as I said, you could use it to create a new column. You can store a new column in the data frame or in the tibble. And so here as the output result, you have like X, Y, and Z. So you've created a new column of data using the dollar sign operator. Um, using a dollar sign can also be convenient when performing quick summaries. Um, like if you, want to just find 
for example, from a data set, the highest possible value of a variable, you don't necessarily need to use the summarize function. You could just say, I want the max. You can use the max function instead of like a specific variable using the um, dollar sign. So for example, we have a data set called diamonds and within diamonds, there's a variable or a column called carrot. Um, and so this operation allows us to select the highest value within the diamonds data, the highest carrot value within the diamonds data set. Um, and if you wanted to know what is the levels of a variable, you could do diamonds dollar sign cut. So you take your cut variable from within the diamonds data set um, and you put that inside the levels function and it will provide you with what are the different categories of the cut variable. Um, dplyr also has an equivalent to double bracket and dollar sign called pull, um, which takes either a variable name or variable position and returns just the column. And so what that means is we could, you could rewrite this, the above max and levels code to taking your diamonds data set and then piping it to caret pull applied the pull function applied to the caret variable, and then you pipe that to the max function, and it will give you the same result. However, I think, I guess the base R way seems a little bit simpler. Um, and you can do the same thing for levels with the cut variable. Okay, so the next section is tibbles. Um, tibbles are the tidyverse version of a data frame. Um, there's a few differences between tibbles and data frames. Um, a tibble, like I said, is the tidyverse version of a data frame, and a data frame is the base R version of a tibble. Um, and so they're pretty much alike, except in a few in a few ways they're basically different. Um, data frames they match the prefix of any variable names which is also known as partial matching. And there's not really an issue if a column doesn't exist. So for example, data frame, if you create a data frame where you have, if you create the X1 variable equals one in the data frame, and then you go to call a variable that doesn't exist within the data frame, it will just um, print out a null value. Whereas tibbles only ever matched variable names exactly, and they will generate a warning if the column you're trying to access doesn't exist. So for example, we perform the same operation here where we say we want x1 equal to one, and then we're gonna create a tibble. Um, and when we try to call a variable, it will warn you and it says, you know, there's an uninitialized column, like it doesn't exist. Um, and then it will put out a null value. And it create it can create issues for when you're trying to do data analysis. Um, next section lists. So double brackets and dollar sign are also they're really important for working with lists, and it's important to see how they kind of differ. So for example, we take this first example we create a list where A is the numbers one through three, B is the character string, A string, C is pi, and D is list, a list negative one and negative five. So a singular bracket will extract a sublist, um, and it doesn't matter how many elements you extract, but the results will always be a list. Um, so here, we want to look at this. I, I believe str means like structure is telling is a function that tells us what's the structure of like a data of, of like um, an object in R. So here we're saying we want to know what's the structure of this list of the list from one to two. And it R tells you it's a list of two. You know, A is an int variable. 
um, containing numbers one through three. B is a character variable, you know, consisting of the string, a string, quote, in quotations. Um, here we want to know what's the structure of the first element of the list. And we'll tell you it's a list of one. And it tells you, oh, it's an int from one to three, int containing numbers one to three, which is exactly how we stored it here. Um, and then if we say we want to know what's the structure of the list at four at position four of the fourth item in the list, we see here the fourth item of the list is d equals, <clears throat> excuse me, list of negative one comma negative five. So it's saying it's a numerical. It con contains two. So it's a list of one. So it's one. And within that, there's a two element list. So it's a list of two. So those elements consist of a numerical, which is negative one and a numerical that's negative five. Um, and like with vectors, you can subset with a logical integer or character vector. Um, also double brackets and dollar sign operator extract a single component from a, a list. And they also rem remove a level of hierarchy from the list. So for ex so here, um, we want to know what is the structure of double brackets, the first element in the list. And it will tell you, it will just tell you that it's an int containing numbers one through three. Whereas here, when we use the single bracket, it will tell you, oh, it's a list. The variable name is A, and then it will tell you what A consists of. Um, same thing here. Um, you want to know what's the fourth element of the list, um, and it will tell you it's just a list of two consisting of element, two numerical elements, which is um, negative one and negative five. Whereas here, it gave you um, the variable name, like what was it stored? What's the variable called that it was stored into? Um, and was it stored into a list or data frame? It doesn't tell you that. It just says, oh, it's a list. And this is what the list contains. Um, and then same thing here, even though we know, so when we say we know that um, the name of one of the variables in the list is A, and we say what's we apply the str function to it, it will print out the same result. Um, and so there's an example that they gave that was pretty cool. I felt like I thought, and so it goes like this: um, that the difference between a singular a singular bracket and a double bracket is particularly important for lists because a double bracket drills down into the list while the singular bracket returns a new smaller wrist. And to help you know remember the distant the difference, um, you take a look at like this unusual pepper shaker. Um, if the pepper shaker is your list, um, if you, is your list pepper named pepper, then pepper single bracket one is a pepper shaker containing a single pepper packet. So this one right here. If you're using pepper bracket single bracket two, it would look the same, but we contain the second packet. Um, and then pepper bracket one, single bracket one to two, one colon two would be a pepper shaker containing two pepper packets. Um, now, if you do uh, pepper double bracket one, it would extract the pepper packet, the pepper packet itself. So this last image represents pepper double bracket one, while this image represents pepper bracket, single bracket one. Um, and then this same principle applies when you use um, one, one D bracket with the data frame. Um, the data frame of a, of a single bracket variable uh, sorry, using a single bracket to select a variable within a data frame returns a one column data frame while a double bracket selection 
of a variable within a data frame returns a vector. So now we're looking at the apply family of functions. Um, so the apply functions allow us to apply a function over each element of a vector. Um, and the most important member of this family is L apply, which is similar to per, um, the per the map function in the in the per package. Um, and yeah, sorry about that. So there's no like base R equivalent to the across function um compared to the other examples where we could have like a tidyverse to base r comparison um but you can kind of get close to that using a singular bracket with the l apply function um and that's because if you look if you look at the i guess the anatomy of the l apply function um applies so applying l the l apply a function on a data frame applies the function to each column if that makes sense and that's because data frames data frames are lists of columns so for example here we've created a tibble with the a b c d e variables um stored it in a variable called df. Um, and so first, if we wanted to find numeric columns, we say we're using the supply function, and then we're selecting df, and then we're selecting those that are, we're saying uh, return the ones in which are numeric. And you're storing that into another variable called numcalls. And so when we evaluate it, we see that A is numeric, B is numeric, C isn't numeric, D is numeric, is not numeric, and E is numeric. So, and they're printed out false, true, true, false. So they're printed out as logical statements. Um, and then we can transform each column with the L apply function and then replace the original values. So when we use, for example, data frames, single brackets, and we select, we want to select num calls. Um, or actually, we're taking the L apply function and we're applying it to um, wait, let me rephrase this. So data frame Okay, so I'm gonna to try to explain this as best I can. So within the L apply function, you have these arguments. You have your data frame here, and then you're having what you're gonna to do to the data frame here. And then you're gonna store that into the num calls column in the data frame. Um, so you're applying this to the data frame column called num calls, and then this is the result of that operation. Um, yeah. Yes, I believe that's what's happening here. Um, and then I believe it's those aspects of num calls that correspond to data frame that is also being reflected in this um, operation when you 
when you store the results of L apply into data frame single bracket um, num calls column. Um, and so here, just to explain it a little bit, the code uses a new function called S apply. Um, and it's similar to L apply, but it's supposed to simplify the results, hence the S. And um, so here we're producing a logical vector instead of a list. Um, yeah. And there's another version of uh, S apply called V apply, um, short for vector apply. And it makes an additional argument that specifies the expected type, ensuring that simplification occurs the same way regardless of the input. For example, we could replace the S apply call above with V apply, where we specify what we expect um, is dot numeric function to return a logical vector of length one. So we have within, so in the vapply function, we're using our data frame, we're, we're specifying the ones that are numeric. And then we're saying to return a logical vector of length one. Um, and then the distinction between S apply and V apply is important when they're inside a function, um, but it usually doesn't matter in data analysis. And then another one is T apply, which computes a single grouped summary. So here, for an example, we have our diamonds data set again. So for the tidyverse example, you know, you take your diamonds data set and then you pipe it to group by cut and then you pipe that to the summarize function where you're saying price is equal to the mean price and you get a tibble of five by two versus just using t apply where you're selecting the price variable the cut variable and you're having it output the mean across both wait yeah by each um, level of cut um, so unfortunately, t, t apply returns its results in a named vector, um, which requires some wrangling if you want to collect multiple summaries and grouping variables into a data frame. Um, and it's it could potentially slow you down um, just to do something like that. Um, yeah. So now for section 27.5, which is for loops. Um, we're looking at the famous for loop. Um, it's also They're also known as a fundamental uh, building block of iteration and they correspond to, oh, and when you look under the hood of your apply function, you'll see um, that this is what they consist of. So this is the basic structure of a for loop. So you just say for, element and vector, and then within your curly braces, you specify what you're, you want your for loop to do. Um, for loops, the most straightforward for loops are used to achieve the same effect as the walk function, which is to call some function with the side effect on each element of a list. And so for example, you could, here's an example of this, taking your paths data set and piping it to append file um, with a walk function applied to it. Um, and instead of doing that, you could just do a for loop where you're saying for path and paths, curly brace, append file and path. Um, and then things can get a little bit interesting when you want to store it, store the output of a for loop. Um, so here's some examples of that, I, I believe. 
this is assigning your directory and then this is a map function where you're taking the paths data set and then you want to output it as an excel file um Oh, sorry. You're reading all the Excel files in this directory. Your directory is like data gap minder or whatever, and you're telling it that it's an Excel file. And that's you put that in, I guess your a pass variable. And then using the map function, you're saying I want to read all the Excel files in that files directory. And then you're going to store it into files. Um, and then there's like, there's like a few different techniques that you can use, but, um, the authors recommend being explicit about what the output is going to look like up front. So in this case, they're going to want to list the same list length. They want to, they're going to want to li uh, list the same length as paths, um, which you can create with the vector function. So here, for example, you take vector, the vector function. Uh, I believe you specified as a list and you're you want it to be as the length the length of your paths variable. Yeah, your paths variable. And then you store that into files also. And then then instead of iterating over the elements of paths, we'll iterate over their indices using the function seek along to generate one index for each element of the paths as shown here, and then you can use the indices, or using the indices is important because it allows us to link to each position in the input with the corresponding position in the output. So here we have a for loop that says for I in seek along pass, curly brace, um, you are, you are storing the result of your, I guess the files in those directories. So from the read Excel package, you're using the read Excel function to apply to all the elements in the paths variable. And you're using a double bracket um, I for it. And the I corresponds to um, each in this in seek along paths. Um, and then you're storing that into the files variable with a double bracket. Um, so I guess it's incrementing along the elements within the pass variable, which I believe, if I understand correctly, consists of all your Excel files in your directory. Um, and then to combine the list of tibbles into a single tibble, you can use do dot call. You can use the do dot call function and the R bind function. And so here is an example of that. Um, yeah. And then rather than making a list and saving the results as you go, a simpler approach is just to build up the data frame piece by piece. So here they they stored null object into out and then they did a for loop saying so for the for a path and paths curly brace um they did they applied an r bind function to the variable with null stored inside of it stored inside of it and then from the read excel package they take the read excel function and apply it to the path variable, which contains a bunch of Excel files. And then they apply the rbind function to that, and then they store that into out um, for the output. And then we recommend, but ultimately they recommend avoiding this pattern because it can become slow when the vector is very long. Um, yeah. And so for the last for the last section, we're looking at plots. So a lot of people who use R tidyverse tend to use ggplot2, but there are some base R 
functions that are also just as powerful as tidyverse for plotting your data. So for example, um, histogram, you have the histogram function and the plot function, also known as plot and hist. Um, so here on the left, an example, we have plotted a histogram of um, the caret variable from the diamonds data set. Um, and I believe you can also, you could potentially adjust the bin widths and the color of the graph as well. You can also change the axis, axis label and the axis title. Um, and on the right, you have a plot of the caret variable from the data from the diamonds data set versus the price variable from the diamonds data set. Um, and you can see how the data appears on this dot on this plot. Um, in the same way that you can potentially change the axes titles here and here, you can also change the axes titles here. And I think you can also add a title to this plot and you can potentially change the color of this plot. And you can also add a trend line if if it's relevant to your analysis. Um, and so finally, you should note that the base plotting functions work with vectors. So you need to put co pull columns out of the data frame using the dollar sign or some other technique. Um, yeah, and that's that's the end of that chapter. Thanks, Aruka. And yeah, with the with the plotting, um, I think there there was like a LinkedIn thread at one point. Well, I don't know if you thought a post, kind of like um, like G plot is amazing, especially like when you want to do like things that are really like um detailed and in depth. But like especially that histogram, it's so much simpler to just make the histogram with um base R compared to like trying to do it with um ggplot too. So yeah. Yeah, I agree because I've tried to, I I like the customizability of ggplot2 histograms, um, but I like the simplicity of, you know, the histogram, the base art histogram. Plus so far I haven't really had to make a lot of like fancy histograms. So, you know, I haven't had to use more complicated um, interactivity and plus, my computer isn't that powerful, so I I really like the simple um, format of the base R plotting function yeah. versus like the more complicated stuff. But if it comes yeah. down to like presentation, I need like colorful graphics. Definitely, I'll I'll tap into like ggplot too. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, but yeah. Thank you so much for this. There's there's a lot here to unpack. Like I'm now kind of like learning for loops and yeah <laughs> those are interesting yeah I really? I really suck at for loops I I'm actually kind of glad it came up in this chapter because um it refreshed my memory and also I I've been practicing a little bit trying to get better at for loops but um yeah I think um yeah. They have, they're very useful, they have their uses. And I've definitely run into situations in which I think using a for loop would be good or the L apply function. Like if you are doing like repetitive analysis, um, like if you need to do like, let's say multiple logistic regressions in a row, you know, like using L apply would be like 10 times more simpler than having to like copy and paste a line of code every single time just yeah. to do your analysis um yeah. yeah and even like so for work we use jump which i guess is similar to sas because sas people make it so i'm learning mm -hmm. jump scripting language and it's like it's way more it's way closer to base r than it is to tidyverse because i feel like i like tidyverse for making things like easy and making it makes things make sense kind of thing yeah and I, uh, uh, I feel like base R is I feel like it's kind of closer to what coding is or my assumption of like what it is to actually do like regular coding versus like um tidyverse but, yeah 
So it's like yeah, it's I, closer to like other. Oh, sorry, go ahead. Yeah. Oh no, no, it's okay. You can continue. Oh yeah. No, I was just saying. Yeah. So it's like in learning jump, I feel like, or learning jump scripting language, it's like it's way closer to like Basar than it is Tidyverse. I think I I it would be I would like to one day have the opportunity to learn jump, um, because it seems it would be like a really nice it would be a really cool skill to pick up. Um, I think I agree. I feel like base R, I like how Tidyverse seems to simplify everything. I feel like it makes sense, but I kind of also understand a little bit better now why base R is the way that it is. I just kind of feel like I'd. I just don't like having to take, having to be in a position where you have to keep account of all the brackets that you're using, you know, because yeah. sometimes I've ran into situations in which I tried to do some subsetting and I'll be like stuck on an error for like 30 minutes, not realizing that I forgot simple brackets in an operation. But I feel like for a lot of the tidyverse examples that they showed, you you don't really have to worry about leaving out, you know, brackets or missing a bracket to do the yeah, to but, do the work. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But, all right. This was great. Thank you so much for this presentation. I really appreciate it. Yeah, no problem. Thank you for having me.